thank you so much for doing this. I always, as I just mentioned to you a few minutes ago, as we were discussing, like the guests to kind of introduce themselves a little bit, tell us a bit about who you are, what brings you here and kind of what's going on in your life. Sure. So uh, again, my name is Al Levin. I'm a public school administrator. I've been in ed public education for over 20 years and I've been in a, an administrative role for probably about 15 years or so. Um, and on the side, I'm a mental health advocate and uh, I am heavily into that space um, because it's become a huge passion of mine. I have my own story of experiencing two bouts of major depression. Um, one that was serious enough that uh, I became suicidal and checked myself into a partial hospitalization program. And after recovering a couple of years after that, I just decided, you know, I, I should probably share my story. I feel like I was in hiding about it. It didn't feel good. It didn't feel right. Um, I started learning more about depression. I started seeing more uh, data around statistics and things and just decided I, I felt compelled to share my story. So um, I started a blog. Uh, I couldn't even like Google and find my own blog. So then I started a Twitter account. And then from there, I started getting recognized by some people and invited to some conferences and such. And I walked away from one conference with uh, the idea of a podcast. And uh, so I have a podcast that's been running for over four years. Uh, I was lucky enough to have you on the show long ago, that's quite good. a while ago. Yes. And, uh, you know, I started by interviewing men who had experienced uh, depression and or other mental illnesses. And, uh, and then expanded from there to now include deep dive conversations with guest experts on various topics. I love um, learning so much more about the research around depression and mental illnesses and speaking right to the researchers has been phenomenal for me. Um, and, and all the lived experiences, it's just selfishly, uh, I, I love it. I learned so much, you know, from the, the people on the show, it's been phenomenal. And then since then, also uh, about a year ago or so, I, I uh, got a position on the Minnesota State Advisory Council for Mental Health, and, and then soon thereafter jumped on to the state um, suicide task force as well. So um, like I mentioned, really pretty deeply embedded in the, the mental health piece and love it. Yeah, it really yeah. feeds me. Yeah, I mean, this is amazing. I think, I think when I was starting my foray into all of that stuff, I think that's how I came across you many years ago. And I think I applied or whatever it was to get on your, to uh, get on your podcast. And yeah, it's just amazing. I, you're not too much older than me, but a little bit like how the, you know, people of your generation really started to pave the way and all this work that you've done over the years is awesome. And it sort of allows, you know, people like me to continue or to join or to take part in it all. And yeah, it's just inspiring. You're an inspiring guy. So this is awesome. I'm so oh, happy thank to, you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I've never really thought of being one that has paved the way, but, <laughs> but maybe that's true. You know, I, I think I was speaking publicly before a lot of people started coming forward and it's been great to see, you know, I think seeing the celebrities and athletes start speaking out so much more about it has really has helped a lot, I think, to allow others to start talking about it. And, and a big piece about that is, is then more people are more likely to get help that they need, you know, because they're willing to talk about it and willing to admit to it. A little less shame. Yeah, that, that is the, I just got a wave of goosebumps because like, that's the, what is it that brings people to that point of saying, you know, I'm ready to get help or I'm, I know something is not okay. I don't know what to do and I need help. Maybe that's a good opportunity for me to ask you that question since, since sharing personal experience is always so helpful. So can you just tell us how, I don't know how far back you want to go. I love hearing people's stories. So you can go back yeah. as far as you want what was the process I guess or as a young person and as you became an adult and just started experiencing these things if you could kind of 
maybe yeah. take as long as you want and and up until the point of sort of where you said i need help and then maybe yeah we can kind of go from there yeah that sounds good so um you know i really i don't think i never think of myself as somebody who experienced any kind of depression or even anxiety as a kid really um, my first bout of major depression was in 2010, and it's easy to pick out why it happened. I was promoted from an assistant principal into a principal role. Um, I, I was put into a situation where, you know, probably unlike a lot of new principals, um, you know, where uh, there, there was, were budget cuts. Uh, I was going into a building that had a major deficit. I had to cut staff before I even met them. Um, we had class sizes that were skyrocketing and teachers getting frustrated with us not shutting it down. And I would call the placement center and be like, you got to stop our enrollment. And, <laughs> and they would just say, well, it's school choice, you know? And I felt like I, it was a, um, you know, I was a solo uh, principal as a new principal, no, no assistant principal, no, no, really, I didn't know anybody in the building. So there was nobody to really lean on. And then at home, I had a five-year-old, a three-year-old and two newborns. So, you know, I'd leave one stressful situation for another. And, and it made a lot of sense that I was struggling with depression. And all of a sudden I found myself in, you know, a nine foot by nine foot room, my doctor's office pacing back and forth, um, which wasn't one of my symptoms, but certainly, you know, being fidgety and stuff can be a symptom, but that wasn't typically one of mine, but um, I couldn't sit down and I was just pacing and the doctor walked in and was like, what is going on? And uh, I shared with him those, what I just shared with you. And he was like, yeah, this is absolutely depression. Uh, he got me on a medication and I started seeing a therapist and uh, little by little, you know, I, I was able to work my way through that. And that was really at my brother's urging to go to the doctor. My brother mm -hmm. is a family doctor. So, you know, you mentioned about reaching out for help. It really can be um, very difficult to reach out for help. My brother really pushed me to see a doctor. He's a family doctor, but he lives in England. And uh, so, you know, I think I recovered from that depression. It got pretty bad, but I think I recovered you know, I didn't have to take work off or anything. Maybe I recovered in a, a two or two months or so. My wife may say a little longer. Um, and then uh, after two years as a principal, I decided, you know, I, I never saw my family. Uh, I was up and out of the house before they woke up. It's kind of funny. One of my symptoms was that I knew I was really struggling was I would literally drive down the highway going like 40 miles an hour and like not wanting to get to work. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, I, so I was out of the house in the morning before anybody was up, I'd get home after dinner and nine times out of 10 after bedtime, never saw the kids. So after two years, I asked for a voluntary demotion back to an assistant principal. My first year back was okay, but, uh, there were some weird dynamics. My old mentor, when I was a principal became the principal where I was going to that school to become an assistant principal, he became her boss. And he was also the principal prior to her at that particular school. And a lot of the staff went to him. So she didn't really have a lot of trust in me, but, but it was an all right year, you know, back at, as an assistant principal. And then that principal left and I got a new principal who I really liked, really hit it off with. He's an amazing leader. Still, he's like my, a good friend and mentor of mine to this day. Um, and he's an amazing leader. Uh, so I, you know, started the year with him in August when he rolled in. This was now my second year as an assistant principal. He, um, you know, we hit it off right away. You know, we were um, we'd meet after work for a bite to eat and talk some shop. And uh, I had my evaluation in October and it was great. And then like mid-October, essentially three years to the date, from my first depression, uh, my brother checked the emails and said it was about exactly the same. But I told my best friend and my brother, like, something feels weird in my body, and this is not going to be good. And I could just tell something was happening, and I was fearful it was going to be depression again. And I always say this, the second bout of my major depression, three years after my first, um, 
made my first one seem like a walk in the park, which it was not at all. But this one got really bad. Um, I couldn't really socialize with people, uh, couldn't really communicate very well. I was um, not sleeping. Um, I, I couldn't sleep. I'd roll around in bed. I really couldn't eat. I felt like I had a knot in my stomach and I literally couldn't put food down. I ended up losing about 50 pounds. Um, So uh, it got really bad. And in November on Thanksgiving, I still remember this scene. We went to friends of my wife. It was just a young couple, friends of hers. And I sat at the kitchen island table, the countertop, just like on a stool, watching everybody around me engage and interact. I felt like literally like a fly on the wall and I didn't talk at all. And my kids were running around, you know, my wife was engaging with her friends. And after that night, um, in the later that night, I, I sat down at a table at my house with my wife and we both just said, you know, if that's what it's like with friends, what is going on at work? So I decided like the very next morning, I asked my boss to meet me at a coffee shop. And uh, I said, hey, look, I'm dealing with depression. And he right away just said, take the time you need. You know, we'll be all right. And uh, it shows what a stellar guy he was. You know, when I walked out of there, his first thing he did wasn't like calling the assistant superintendent, freaking out that he had no longer had an assistant Mm -hmm. principal for who knows how long. But he reached out to my wife to say, hey, Al just shared with me a depression. Just know he should be on his way home. And uh, I ended up taking two weeks off of work. And in hindsight, it was an awful idea. I had no plan other than I'm going to make an emergency meeting with my psychiatrist to try to adjust my meds, maybe get in for some therapy. Um, And, you know, I, I couldn't even I couldn't get off the couch. I was on the couch. I'd tell my wife, Hey, my therapist says it's a brain, like a brain injury and I just need to sleep. So I'd go upstairs and lay down in my bed and not sleep at all, but roll around for like three hours because that was like my safety place behind closed doors Mm -hmm. in my room. Um, But it was miserable. I mean, every time I walked past my bed, I was, I had this sick feeling in my gut. Like I knew I wouldn't be able to sleep. I remember I used to lay down with one of my kids um, and help them get to sleep. And like 15 minutes later, my wife would always wake me up when I was healthy. And she'd be like, you fell asleep, but you know, get up. And at this point, like, I remember one night my daughter nudged me and she was like, okay, dad, I'm good. And I didn't get up. I just wanted to stay in her bed with her because if I was there long enough, I could wake up and it would be time for me to go to bed. Um, I would make small lists of things that I wanted to do. I would make a list like just wash uh, one load of laundry or clean one bathroom. And I couldn't, I couldn't do any of that. I didn't want to go outside because I didn't want to bump into anybody, you know, who might see me from work or the community. I knew a lot of people because I've been in the district a long time. So didn't want to go out and see somebody and have them be like, why aren't you at work? Right. So that um, it was, it was really bad. I I had incredible um, crying bouts when I was going back to work uh, where I would hold it together at work, hold it together for my kids and then just ball uncontrollable crying bouts in the evening. Um, So, you know, I had, I would, I, I wouldn't say I was feeling too much better, But after that amount of time off, I was feeling the need to get back to work. And there was like a one week period before school, um, before winter break would start. So I thought that would be a great test period. Went back to work and uh, things didn't get better. And in fact, I started to have what they call passive thoughts of suicide. Like I'd be better off not here, you know, or um, just things like that. And I went to my psychiatrist and said, hey, you know, I'm starting to have some thoughts of suicide and and could this be the depression or could this be the uh, meds? Because as ironic as it is, many antidepressants have a black box warning stating that they can cause suicidal ideation. And he said, yeah, it could be the depression, could be the meds, but he decided to up the meds, which I found out later from another psychiatrist was a really bad idea because the efficacy of that particular med 
had no better efficacy at any other higher level than I was already at. Mm. And my suicidal thoughts got really bad and very pervasive. Um, I started, I mean, and I was doing some weird stuff. Like I found myself in my bedroom with the lights turned off on my laptop. I had Google searched suicide and found my very first website showed different methods of suicide and it rated from one to 10, how much pain you would endure and how many seconds until death would, would happen. Um, and I slammed my laptop shut just unbelievable, you know, not believing I could even be doing that. Um, and I was doing other things like that. The, um, I, and I was considering like double methods in case one method didn't work. There would be another one that, you know, that I was doing at the same time so that for sure it would be, it would end with suicide or death. And, uh, Eventually, I came up with a plan and I had a plan in mind. I had the means and everything and I couldn't get it out of my head. Every 20 minutes, I'd push the thought away and 20 minutes later, the thought was in my head. And I, it was really scaring me. And one evening, uh, I woke up in the middle of the night and just sat up in bed. I had dreamt of the plan and it scared the hell out of me. And I grabbed my wife, I grabbed my sister and said, I need an emergency psychiatric exam uh, appointment and I need you there to help me advocate for me. And I was so glad I did that and asked for their help because they both were adamant. My sister put her fist down when the doctor said, you know, you could take work off, but it could be more stressful too. And my sister was like, he needs time off. And I was so glad. Um, and then, you know, just because of the way our systems work, I, I was at home and my sister and wife were helping me try to figure out next steps, right? So luckily I found a partial hospitalization program. So I took more time off of work, took three more weeks off of work to check myself into a partial hospitalization program, which involves going to a program. This happened to be in a hospital. Um, going to the hospital program from nine to three thirty or four every day, but then coming home to the family. Um, and so I did that for three weeks and it was a beautiful kickstart, I would say to my recovery, but, uh, you know, I jumped back with a different psychiatrist and therapist after that as well. And the therapist said, you know, after a depression as deep as you were in, it's going to take a full year really to fully recover from that. Um, and again, I had a great boss where I, I did start working again after the three weeks. I told him I am not 100%, but I wouldn't be here if I didn't think I could do the job. Mm -hmm. He asked what he needed to take off my plate. So he was super supportive. And uh, that was really that's that essentially is the whole story, Mike. You asked for it, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, I agree with you. You know, I, I believe so strongly in sharing stories. I mean, that's yeah. the whole premise of my podcast, right? Yeah. The start of it. Because I do believe, I believe people resonate with it. Um, I think, you know, when I give presentations publicly, so many people can either relate to the feelings or know somebody dealing with depression or know somebody, unfortunately, who had tragically died by suicide. Um, and I, I believe it gives hope and allows others to start sharing their own story. Um, and that way, reach out and get the help they need, too. So thanks for the opportunity to let me share. Yeah, oh, I got so many questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because I'm in Canada, I know you know our, our healthcare systems are similar but different. I'm curious. I guess what did you find most helpful? I guess in the we call it PHP, the par partial hospitalization program. I went to something similar for addiction recovery, um, which I also found very useful and helpful. What, what, in terms of the internal dialogue for you of this sort of mix of self-criticism or hopelessness or despair or fear, lack of trust, sort of in others, did you have a particular theme to that? I think it's so helpful for people to hear some of the internal dialogue or the themes. Yeah. 
yeah, while I was going through yeah. the depression. Yeah. And what, but, yeah, what was the nature of that for you? Yeah. So um, I was incredibly hard on myself. I think I always am, but I think it got mm-hmm. so exacerbated through the depression. I mean, anything anybody said at work, I took as an attack on me and they hate me and I'm a bad administrator. And one perfect example I have is um, somebody was complaining to me one day about the schedule and how awful the schedule was. And I walked away from the conversation like, oh, my God, they they hate me. I did a terrible job when in reality and I couldn't look at reality when I was in this depressed state. But looking back, like. I had a whole team create that schedule. I pulled in all the stakeholders from different grade levels and from, you know, in, I work in a school, all the different grade levels, the special ed department, the ELL department, like this was a collaborative crew that created the schedule. And, sh- and that teacher was absolutely right. The schedules have become a nightmare with everything we're trying to put in and all the requirements and um, they are really, really complicated. And now I can have that conversation in a healthy way and understand. But when I was depressed, it was an attack on me. Um, and everything I, it was just, I was so negative on myself and beat myself up and really um, pointed a, a finger at myself when it wasn't even about me. Right, um, right, right. Yeah, I mean, I remember a person yeah. even saying something like about the previous principal to me. And they said, well, well, I could say a lot more, but I I shouldn't. And in my mind, it was like, they were going to say how much worse I am or something when really it was probably like, and you know, they were awful because they didn't want to (laughs) throw the person under the bus. And, um, but again, I just like led that in my head uh, around me. It was really, really bad, the negativity. And, and I couldn't stop that either. Um, and then also another big part, I think this has to do with some of the negative self-talk. It might be a little different, but looking back on it, I had a ton of shame, a ton of shame. And that's something that I try to, to get men and others to, to not have through depression, right? You, you don't really have shame if you have cancer or diabetes. Well, depression is a a mental illness. It is an illness too. And there is no reason to have shame. But some of the examples I give is we have a store called Walgreens. They have a pharmacy in them and that's where I got my meds. And it was like two blocks from my house. I literally walked up and down every single aisle to make sure not a single neighbor was in that store before I went to the counter to get my antidepressant, which first of all, they don't even say like antidepressant. <laughs> well, right? live in. So, so they're pretty, you know, yeah. conspicuous about it. And then, uh, and then I would get home and I would literally shred all the paperwork and tear it all up into tiny pieces. I guess thinking like maybe someone will go through my trash and be like, aha, Al's on an antidepressant, but like so much shame. And it made it really tough for me to reach out for help. And um, one of the examples I have that I share with people about how difficult it is to reach out for help and how much I understand that one is a, a data point that that says the, you know, research shows people live with depression for 10 years yeah. on average before reaching out for help. And for me, I had a, my very best friend told me one day, he was like, I know somebody and all he does is work with men with depression and anxiety. You got to call him. And it took me three weeks to reach out to a guy who specializes with men and depression. Took me three weeks. And at the beginning of each week, I would text my friend and be like, okay, tell him I'm going to call him. And I I couldn't do it. Um, After three weeks, I finally did. But that was the time like you know, just before I was going into the PHP. So, um, but yeah, most of the dialogue was just so harsh towards myself. And then how did you, I love that, that imagery of, sorry, before the question of walking down the aisles in the, in the thing and the, it's amazing how our minds create these stories and narratives and, oh, but yeah, that's so good. <laughs> I, I also, you know, I have a, I, I take medication for ADHD. You know, I have my thing here, but I still have moments where, yeah, that internal narrative of there's something wrong with me 
I need to hide this. I, I right. still even, I don't hide it at all from my kids. Although yeah. there's moments where I, I, I can't, well, I don't try to stop it, but I just, I do get an overwhelming sense of shame or, or embarrassment or yeah. whatever. Well, and, it and passes, right. But yeah. And I think a bunch of that is still from the stigma, which is another reason I do all this advocacy work to help get rid of that stigma. Because I think if there wasn't a stigma and if there wasn't people um, with all the stereotypes, you know, I'll still hear people say like, oh, they didn't take their meds today, you know, yeah, yeah. It, like in jest because nobody knows if they're really mentally ill or on meds, but that's just a right, phrase right, right. they'll use because yeah. person's acting so crazy. They didn't take their meds. Right. And you start hearing comments like that and you take meds, like there's all this negativity around it. And again, you don't hear that about meds for any other illness. Right. Yeah. So I think the more we talk about it, you know, one thing I've heard, I heard, have heard that out East, like New York and um, Massachusetts, there, there's a lot more normal conversation around seeing a therapist where people might say, yeah, you know, I'll let's, let's grab dinner together, but I got to hit, you know, I'm going to the psychiatrist psychologist first. I'll yeah. see you after my appointment. You know, and, and here it's like all undercover still, like no one will say they're going to a psychologist or people are like, whoa, you're a psychologist. Right. You know, so I'm, I'm often sharing with my staff or anybody yeah, else like, nice. yeah, hey, I, I got to leave work early, a little early. I got my psychologist appointment. You know, when I say it like like it doesn't like I'm not concerned and I shouldn't be concerned. Right. I, mm. I think. Really, I think everybody should be seeing a psychologist. Yeah, no, man, I, I, I definitely agree with that. Okay, so when you, how did that narrative start turning around? I'm, I'm just kind of curious, what are some of the things that you find helpful for yourself and that have kind of kept you or keep you as well as you can be? Um, you know, I've done a lot of work around it. I've done a lot of therapy mm -hmm. and a lot of the, the most common type of therapy for those negative thoughts that, that I'm aware of is CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, which okay. is a, exactly about all of that, right? Like there's an action that happens and then we create our own thought and attach a thought to it. Like my thought was, oh my gosh, she's talking about the schedule, but she's complaining about me, right? right, right? right That's yeah, the negative yeah. thought. And then my negative thought spirals down to I'm a bad administrator. And then my behaviors change. So I start isolating in the office because I don't want to go out and do any classroom observations and tell teachers what they should be doing when I'm a crappy administrator, right? So yeah, it yeah, impacted yeah. my behavior when, you know, CBT tells you to catch those negative thoughts, like stop yourself. Like if I had been healthy, I could have said, okay, she's complaining about the schedule. That's, that's not about me. And I know the facts are we, I had a whole team create that schedule. So I stopped that thought. I changed that thought. And then I act based on my new thought. Um, so I, I do a lot of that because I'm really negative and harsh on myself and I'm aware of it. And now I'm able to catch it. And I think I do it a lot less frequently. Mm -hmm. And that has been a huge help. Um, I also, uh, one of the smartest things I did, um, and, and it happens to be the dude who runs the support group, uh, he, the guy who works with men with depression, and anxiety, he, one of his big pieces through his foundation is support groups. And one of the smartest things I did was I connected with him. And just before I checked myself into the partial hospitalization program, I went to one of the support groups and got connected with them. So when I left the PHP, I was able to jump right back into a support group, a system that I already joined and became a part of. And that, so my last bout of major depression, hopefully my last and final, but who knows, was in 2013. And I am still going every other week to that men's group for support um, for depression and anxiety. I love giving back to the men in the group. And I also am able to share things around my own challenges and stuff, right? There's plenty I can talk about um, through everyday life, right? And four kids and being an administrator and dealing with conflict where I can, and that has been really centering and really helpful. And if I start beating myself up, that's a place where I can say, you know, I, I feel so awful because, and these guys are just so supportive and amazing. Tons of guys in this 
he, he runs many, many groups. And uh, one of the uh, many of the men will say this, these groups saved my life. And uh, I, I'm a huge supporter and believer in support groups. Um, it, it helps you see you're not the only one. It helps um, you. I, I could open up immediately. I knew I was with a bunch of men who had been there. Right. I mean, everybody's level of depression is different, but they had struggled at some point and I knew they were going to be non-judgmental. And nine times out of 10, you bring up a scenario and somebody else in the group's been there, you know, and done it. And they have ideas and thoughts and nobody tells you what you have to do. But and we'll push one another like, dude, you've been talking about that for three months now and you haven't done. You know, these were some ideas. Right. And we push each other hard in a really healthy way. And guys know it's because we care about each other. So um, that has been, I think, a huge, and uh, I'll just give them a little shout out. That's called faceitfoundation.org. Awesome. Yeah, um, it's it's just can. local, but um, they do other pieces too. And, and they may do some online stuff now even, but uh, it's an awesome organization run by a licensed social worker who left his job one day dealing with his own major depression. And he shares his story, but he just quit one day and created a, a nonprofit to support men with depression and anxiety face it foundation foundation.org yeah so that's a big one you know that that's really helped me and that's one of the pieces that i will not give up um as a as one of my supports you know i still do things right i still take a medication for depression and my psychologist has even said you know we should maybe wean you and i'm like i'm not you know that i usually have a pretty good excuse not to recently i was changing schools uh, for work where uh, he had talked about it. And I was like, I don't know, you know, I'm going to be in new situations, meeting new staff. Um, and for me, and maybe it's a crutch, may, you know, one day, maybe I'll be like, yeah, I'm going to be done with this, but I don't really have side effects from it. And if it's one of the things that's keeping me out of the deep, dark, hellish hole that I would never wish upon my worst enemy and never want to be in again, then I don't want to give it up, you know? So, um, so I definitely, I'm conscious and aware of my mental health, even though I haven't really struggled with depression since 2013. That was quite a long answer for that brief question. Oh, it was beautiful. Wasn't it? <laughs> it was beautiful. It was beautiful. I, I want to really kind of, and I was getting goosebumps again with the, with, well, also the medication piece, but I'll start from the kind of beginning on the CBT stuff, which is super helpful and useful and and whatever tool any you need and this is sort of speaking to other people who are listening or even to myself whatever tool i can get my hands on that's going to help me in this moment awesome and the more tools we have the better and and the um the support group stuff it was so nice to hear you talk about that because as a therapist myself, when I'm talking to people who aren't suffering with addiction problems, it's really hard to find good support groups. And the I am forever in sort of grateful and indebted and ad, admire Alcoholics Anonymous because it was massively helpful for me and my sponsor Today, I still talk to him almost every day. He's been my sponsor for over 10 years. And that guy saved my life. And as you kind of, in the way that you just kind of described with these groups, there's just something so magical about it. And I've spent lots of time in Al-Anon groups and other groups. And just, I have a meditation group. Uh, the lady who runs it's a medical doctor. So in, on, in Canada, that's covered by OHIP most usually so it's covered by the government which is amazing and there's just something anybody listening the power of group healing is so incredible and i it's a glaring hole in our i don't i'm not sure exactly how it works in the u.s i know it's probably actually quite different from state to state but Actually, that's an assumption. I don't know if that's true, but here it's hard to find groups. And I often have in the back of my head, I did run, I ran a mindful meditation group throughout COVID for a a year or so. That was really nice. It sort of had its natural ending to it, but 
it's, I don't have the words for it, but when you hear other people bear their soul, like you said, you realize you're not alone. Yeah. You're not the only one dealing with this. It's so empowering and, and magical. And to hear you say you still go, it's the same for me. You see people in recovery, long-term recovery. They've been going for 20, 30, 40 years. And it's, yeah. Yeah. And, and they go because they like it and it fulfills them. It's not like, Oh, I have to go. You yeah. Know, that kind yep. of thing. And, yeah. and face it, you know, models themselves essentially on the AA model. Right. Um, like I'm one of the leaders in my group, you know, yeah. so, um, it started with just one dude and his, uh, brother-in-law, uh, who created the foundation and they ran their, they each ran one group, but they've expanded. <laughs> so awesome. They've moved yeah. twice now since I started with them into larger facilities and they have, uh, guys who have been through and are doing well, who lead the groups. Right. Yeah. So it's yeah. all led by, Man. by peers. And then now they've started for about a year, I'd say, or so having facilitator meetings like once or twice, a, like once a month or so where all the leads get together. And sometimes they'll bring in a therapist and give us mm-hmm. some training. You know, sometimes we just talk about how's it going? What kind of challenges have you bumped into? You know, um, but it's, it's, a, it's an awesome thing. And yeah, I, I can't speak highly enough about the support groups here in the States. You know, I think if people are listening and they're looking in the States, one of the best places to probably check out would be NAMI.org and NAMI is national Alliance on mental illness. They're the largest grassroots organization around mental health. They are not a service provider, so you don't go there for therapy, but they do create support groups Mm -hmm. and they do um, have classes. um, So like family members of those with mental illness or those struggling with different mental illnesses, they have a lot of education. They're a huge lobbyist for, um, you know, to create laws around mental illness here. So National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI.org. And then you can look up their affiliates on the website. So they usually have different um, affiliates. And But like you said, you know, I think it's probably got to be large urban areas for the most part. Otherwise, to find a support group would be really tough. But that would be the first place I would start looking, um, unless you're lucky enough to have other small organizations, community mental health organizations that create their own support groups, because they are so important. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, I want to ask you about how you talk to your kids about mental health. Yeah, and how does that go? And just I'd love to kind of get in, in, your insights yeah. on that. Yeah. So that's a great question. So my first bout of depression, the kids were five, three yeah. and two newborns, right? Yeah. My second bout was three years later. So eight, six and three and three. So they were still really young at the yeah. time and yeah. going to a PHP was easy enough that I didn't really have to even acknowledge it. Cause it was almost like I was going to work. My hours were a little different. I was a little surprised. My oldest one didn't say, dad, you're not wearing a tie to work anymore. Or dad, you're suddenly able to drive me in the winter to school <laughs> instead of going to work before me. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, you know, I'm sure they were focused on themselves. So my oldest uh, two, my 16 year old and 14 year old, especially the 16 year old, I've talked to pretty much in depth about my whole depressive bouts other than the suicidal ideation, which I just couldn't get myself to talk about, you know, in my mind, um, I I think I was a little worried that some of the thoughts they might have are like, you, you had us, your kids, me, and you wanted to kill yourself. Like, what does that say about me? Right. Um, And so I think, you know, she's now 16, the oldest, I, I would be comfortable sharing again, probably not in depth about the plans and stuff, but just that I had suicidal thoughts and such. I think it's a really important conversation. So my 16 and 14 year old both know about it. Um, My 11 year olds, they know that I have a show called the depression files and stuff. Um, (laughs) But I haven't really dove into it at all with them, but it's been great. You know, my, 
oldest started learning about mental illnesses in school. So she came home and started sharing with me and yeah. uh, she's dealt with a couple of friends with mental illnesses. My 14 year old, we started her in therapy when she was probably about 10. Cause she was just struggling with emotions, huge anger, and then huge happiness, just huge feelings. And that's been awesome. Even, you know, that was a long time ago. We started, she'll still go like once a month and loves those days. She, you know, they're her Angie days. She gets to go see Angie. So I love the fact that, you know, we're trying to create a family that is okay with therapy and can yeah. talk about therapy and know you don't have to be sick or ill to go to a therapist. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's yeah. just helpful. Right. That, I think that's the biggest thing for me. I mean, I do worry, right? There is some uh, evidence of hereditary, yeah, yeah, a hereditary sure. piece with yeah. mental illness, right? And my 16 year old, you know, in a couple of years, will be going off to college, which gets me worried and all the high school and middle school drama and the social networking and the bullying that is 24 hours a day now because of the social networks. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so what we're really, what I'm really trying to do is create fam kids who are willing to talk about their feelings and willing to talk about challenging times so that they don't bottle it up. Um, you know, I think that's, I feel like that's one of the best things we can do. And even if it's not with me, if they know, like you can go to a therapist, your dad, I, I go to a therapist, you know, you're, um, when I actually, when I, uh, finished when I get started to get better from my major depression, the second bout, I urged my wife to see a therapist. Cause I can't imagine what I put her through. I think of some of the things I said to her and like, it had to have been traumatic. And, uh, it was luckily I had invited her to a therapy session or two or three of mine because she would ask me how she could help. And I was like, I don't know. You want to go to therapy with me? And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and she, I That's still awesome, remember, man. I still remember she walked out of the first one going, wow, that was pretty cool. You get to sit on a couch and just talk <laughs> and, and be listened to. And uh, so when I urged her to, to do therapy, once I got better, she, uh, she was all about it and, and talked to her best friend who had a therapist, got a recommendation. It was this Angie woman. She started seeing Angie when our middle, our second to oldest started having those huge emotions. She asked her therapist, you know, would you ever see our kid? And she's like, I don't do kids, but my wife just loved her and was like, Oh, you'd be great. And <laughs> she was great. She was phenomenal. Yeah. And, uh, and my daughter loves her. So, uh, therapy has been good for us all. Uh, and I think that's been a, a huge help. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so touched to hear that probably because sim just similar our, you know our wives are part of the story or you know i'm i'm putting words into your mouth sort of but not really but you know my wife was such a big part of my journey and for sure mine too yeah yeah and when I, yeah go ahead yeah it, it was yeah. just it was crazy to see like when I finally started getting better, my mm -hmm. wife got really sick and like crashed. Yeah. And it was, yeah. um, I think it, it, it wasn't anything too serious, but it was like a huge bout of, I don't remember if it was strep throat or something that really knocked her out for like a week and an infection in her eye. And it was just like, so clear. She had been like yeah. holding herself together through my depression. And once she saw that yeah. Yeah. I could go yeah. out without her worrying or I could do some things around the house. Like she, I think her system just like crashed. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I do have a blog. I don't keep it as up to date as I would like to, cause I'm so focused on the podcast, but one of my blog posts is called spouses need support too. You know, like we got to mm -hmm. think about what significant others in the lives of those struggling with depression and or addiction um, are dealing with because they go through a ton. And I think people don't always consider their needs and what they're going through. Yeah. Yeah. Such a good reminder that that's such an interesting, the, the thing around how you're there, there's lot, there's specific ways to talk about it, but which I don't have the words for, but how your wife kind of, just 
I guess the body, the nervous system, the brain just like stuffs it all down to keep, keep everything together. And then you said it so nicely, kind of once that sense of, I don't have to do this anymore than the, the kind of, I don't know what it is, right? Like yeah. we're, we're cra- animal, like as animals, we have these crazy capacities to handle stress and right. Oh, that's, uh, I, I wonder, I think about for myself, I think I was sober about four years or so. And I went to this mindfulness-based stress reduction program with this doctor I was talking about. And I think of something similar for me too, where I just finally, after years of just working and working to get myself, my shit together, I don't know, I got pneumonia really bad. And I, I don't think it's dramatic to say like near death. Like I was in the ER for a few days. They didn't know wow. what was wrong with me. Yeah. It was so crazy. Oh, it was intense until somehow they decided to give an x-ray and they saw in my lungs that I had pneumonia and that's why it was such a disaster. But so I spent about four days in the ER um, and that I, I don't know what else to attribute that to other than my body was just kind of I had nothing. I don't know what it is, but there's definitely something to that. Yeah. Um, and it was a bit of a sidetrack from, from, I like how you focused it on the caregivers too. I, I have a brother who lives with schizophrenia and my parents have never gone for help, you know, well, at least not that I'm aware of. Right. Um, and yeah, and once my wife in, I guess, so that's a bit of a side note, but yeah, I mean, there's so much, stuff that my parents are probably hanging on to about my brother he's pretty well today but um anyway and then my wife once once i kind of like to tell it like this it was like once i stopped being the problem she had an opportunity to take care of herself i guess is right the thing yeah right and so for the caregivers out there, you know, we wouldn't be here without you. And yeah. also you also deserve to take care of yourselves as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I bet your, your parents have probably struggled, been through a lot with, with your brother yeah, living no with doubt. schizophrenia. No doubt. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's where, you know, I would try to direct those parents to a place like NAMI. I don't know if you yeah. have organizations that yeah, have education have for family members, because it's so cool to be able to learn about it and even support groups we were talking about, right? Like connect with some other parents of, of people with schizophrenia, because I'm sure they're out there. Probably not easy to find, no. you know, all this virtual stuff with Zoom and everything has probably helped those those people with more rare disorders being able to connect with one another. Yeah. Do you think, so my parents, my dad, I think is 75. I think my mom's like 73. Do you, I mean, I think I'm making an assumption in the question, but there's something about that generation that whether or not they just don't seem open to it. You know what I mean? Like there's something about it. I don't know. Yeah. I I struggle to talk about it with them too, because they just, they're there, they're loving to all, you know, to my brother and I, but, and they're not together anymore. But anyway, I just, I, do you have experience talking about it with your parents or how do you see kind of this intergenerational thing? Uh, you know, I think it is uh, more difficult for our family, uh, that generation, right? Yeah. My parents, like we talked to my dad before he passed away about seeing a therapist and he just kind of scoffs like, what am I going to tell them? You know, right, right, um, right. and my mom is more open to it now as she's getting older and we're, we engage in those conversations with her. You know, I think it's easy. I told my brother and sister when we talked about, well, maybe she could use a therapist. I said, you know, I'm happy to be the one to talk to them. I'm the youngest of the siblings, but, um, 
but I, I have this easy in, right? She knows all this mental health work I do. Right. So it's easy for me to start a conversation with her to say, hey, mom, you know, you just lost dad recently. You, uh, you're living on your own. Um, you, you know, she had her driver's license taken recently because we kind of pushed her to take an exam and then her doctor made her take an exam. And that's a loss of independence, right? Which mm-hmm. she's dealing with great, but so I was able to, to come from the, the frame of, I do all this work. I know you're going through some things that are just, you know, life uh, changes for you um, and uh, was able to have that conversation. And she was actually open to it. And I think, you know, if you were going to dive into that conversation with your parents and maybe you decide, you know, it's that, like you said, they're loving parents and they've survived and done well and so forth. But you know, if you did want to engage with that, I think it could be an easy, empathetic conversation of, you know, I bet you too, you know, I'm now that I'm doing a lot more work around addiction and and this stuff, I bet you two struggled a lot with, you know, my brother and schizophrenia. And I wonder if you ever had a chance to talk about that with anybody, because, man, that must have been challenging at times. Yeah, yeah, I, that's a, great way to to just have that simple conversation i've sort of had moments of it but yeah yeah not any real sincere kind of i think i have a bit of hesitation around it for some reason but well i guess partly because of the responses i've had from them over the the, you know similar to your dad's kind of response of just like Right. I did get my mom to do the MBSR program though, which I was awesome. very proud That's of. That's huge. Yeah, yeah. 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 Good for, I mean, she's kind of like the stone angel in a way. That's um, fantastic. Yeah. So that was cool. Um, I'm sort of looking at the time too, and I want to kind of, uh, pull out some more wisdom from you maybe this in, in terms of your experience, like as an educator and in schools. Yeah. I think our sort of small crew and and we are connected also to the largest mental health hospital in Canada. And we do some work with the education there. Is there much, and I assume it probably varies state to state, even city to city in the U S are the schools going about implementing any kind of mental health education or, or, and, I'm curious what the conversations are around social media and stuff like that. Do you know Jonathan Haidt? Yeah, I don't think so. No, he's a pretty well-known, he's a social psychologist from NYU. Um, He, he's sort of, as far as I know, one of the leading academics on social media, societal discourse and polarization in the U S and all those kind of things. And he just, I really admire him because he's sort of taking up the fight against social media for young people and just how destructive it is, no matter how much excuses we all make for, Oh, it helps them connect and blah, blah, blah. It's such a disaster. Right. I mean, for adults too, but I guess, yeah. So that's a bit of a tangent and jumping all over, but how, how are you seeing it going in schools? And uh, one last piece, Don't you think it would be so easy to teach the basics of CBT to a 10 year old almost or a 12 year old kind of thing? Yeah. Even a six year old. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. for sure. And, and we are starting to, uh, at least in the schools I'm in, because I Uh push for it partly because I push (laughs) for it, but, but I've been connected with some people. Like there's a woman who does teach essentially like yoga calm for kids, Uh Uh but yoga calm is kind of a, copyrighted name and stuff. And she's created her own system that's similar and calls it mindful movement and Mm -hmm. works with teachers and teaches, works with the kids while training teachers, um, how to, to do mindful movement and things like that. And it's a lot of it is meditation types of things and some easy yoga moves to get your brain going or to calm yourself and stuff, just some great work. So what I would say is here in the States, we need a lot more mental health support in our school for our students. We are seeing more school linked mental health where some places, some schools are getting a therapist in the school to work with kids. Um, 
And so we are seeing more of that, uh, but we have a lot more that we could do. Um, and my big push now actually is, and, and I, was, I was advocating for this well before the pandemic. Uh, I think that we need to have better mental health systems of supports for our educators. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I was talking about it well before the pandemic. The pandemic has only exacerbated the need and the needs like we saw in our small building this year were just unprecedented. I, I mean, just outrageous the, what we saw with the mental health needs of our educators. And it's um, I think it's almost at a crisis level. You know, I mean, we we're dealing with substitute shortages, teacher shortages. Teachers were getting pulled to teach you know, they'd lose their prep time. So they wouldn't get any prep time to teach. They're dealing with kids who are going in and out of traumatic situations. And they're dealing with the behaviors and the stories from these kids with no time to process, you know, they're stuck in their classroom. And, uh, you know, I think it's coming to a head where they're really going to have to start addressing it and figuring it out. And I'm trying to do more um, myself as an administrator to support teachers within our building. And I'd love to work with other schools and districts to talk about and create better systems. Um, and I think, you know, I had kind of an epiphany with a conversation with somebody recently where, you know, for a long time, I've been talking about these systems that we need for the mental health of educators when really I think some of it is dealing with our existing structures to make sure that we are doing things that aren't necessarily specifically for one's mental health, but actually really benefit their mental health incredibly. Right, right. Like how do the administrators communicate with the educators? Is it in a timely fashion or is it last minute setting everybody up to freak out, right? Simple things like that yeah. um, is what's the purpose and the role of the leadership team. And do teachers have choice and voice in what they're teaching and some agency, um, you know, so different pieces like that, that I think we can improve upon uh, that would make the work environment more supportive and more empowerment to the educators and therefore really improve their mental health. I don't think it has to be um, something specific for mental health, although I have right, been pushing right. for some of that too, right? Like I work in a huge district. I think we should have support groups for all of our social workers in the district, uh, you know, an optional yeah. support group, an optional support group for elementary teachers, middle school and high school teachers for the yeah. administrators, you know, that are yeah. peer led, you know, just so yeah. Yeah. we, because I think we experience a ton and we have no time to, to deal with it. So I do think there are some specific mental health pieces we could put in place, but some of it is just about how the building runs. How do we give, um, educators to say, how is it not all top down? And, you know, you have to do this, 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 and you have to get your test scores up. I mean, that already is creating a dynamic and an atmosphere of pressure and we don't trust you. So we're going to manage you, um, versus, you know, empowering them. Yeah. Wow. Uh, this is sort of a question of ignorance in terms of, and, and I guess I assume it differs from state to state, I hear, I hear that in some places teachers are not paid very well. Like I know here they're paid pretty well, um, but I don't know. Is it does it depend on the state and all that and like the school district and all those things? Or yeah, it it, it really depends. does. Even district to district um, yeah, can yeah, vary yeah. quite a bit. State by state can vary a lot. Sometimes it's because of different cost of living in different states, but a lot of times that doesn't even make up for it. I mean, I've heard about some huge issues, I think, in California where teachers can't even afford, you know, apartment rent right. with the pay they're getting um, some horrible stories. And I do think, you know, educators are not often thought of in high regard. You know, the government makes legislation around it. They make the mandates. They tell us what we have to do. Right. They don't have educators in those conversations. They haven't often stepped into a school themselves. Yeah. You know, they, they talk about funding yeah. us well, but then they give us unfunded mandates. 
Um, and yeah, the, the funding of schools, they, they really need to take a look at that and salaries for educators and, um, and again, what can they do to better support educators? You know, another piece I, uh, I was thinking about was time. Educators need time. They need more time for planning. You know, I think in, in some countries, uh, they allow for like, you teach for like three hours and you have two hours of planning time a day. Like that, that would be unheard of for us, but, but how cool is that? That's saying like, we want you to have solid plans. We know it takes time and effort and we're not going to make you do that all out outside of the school day. You're going to have time for that and work with teams and work with other experts in the building. Um, teachers often, often spend their own money because schools are at, you know, having budget cuts left and right. Yeah, they spend yeah. their own money on supplies for the classroom and stuff, which is pretty outrageous. You know, it should not be that way. So, yeah, yeah in general, I think um, educators need to be paid much, much more. Yeah. Uh, and and the social media piece, can you kind of... Oh. I know, yeah. Yeah. Because you because of your teens, but also yeah. just what do you see in, in schools and well, how is that impacting everybody? Yeah, I work in a pre-K through eight building. Right. Uh, so the middle school, six, seven, eight, yeah, the, the social media is a nightmare. It's disastrous. It is awful for the mental health of our teens. And like you mentioned, even adults, right? Like I know plenty of adults who talk about all the beautiful things they see on Facebook from people, right? But you never hear about the behind the scenes challenges that the families are going through. You only see, you know, they're one day out on a beautiful boat and they post the picture and there they mm -hmm, are. Mm -hmm. and, and it's so easy to go down that negative path of, oh my God, everybody's out there on boats and they have these beautiful jobs and these, you know, and their lives are amazing. But as far as the teens, you know, we, they, the bullying is the biggest thing, right? And the bullying can happen in school and you really have to create some good systems in school to address bullying and deal with, with it head on and hopefully create a culture where students don't allow the bullying. You know, I think mm -hmm. that's the best way because bullies are savvy, right? They're going to do the bullying under the radar of the adults. They're pretty savvy about when and how to bully. Yeah. But these days, the bullying continues, right? Like, at least when I was a kid, you could walk out the door and be like, whew, don't have to deal with that kid till tomorrow. Yeah, right. right now, yeah. it's like you go home and they're posting stuff on these chats or in social on social media. And the bullying and the harassment can be just tirelessly, you know, 24 hours a day. Um, it is it is really bad. And trying to manage and make policies around cell phones and no cell phones and manage yeah, yeah. those pieces are really challenging too. Um, is there, is there any, um, that's one of the things Jonathan Haidt says in his sort of recommendations that as a single parent or a single educator, it's so hard. I can't remember. It's not so much the prisoner's dilemma, but it's that thing where if you can't do it by yourself, right? right? If one parent, right. then your kids are left out, then, and then, and so any conversations around kind of any collective action or when you get together with staff, any discussions on, yeah, I guess I'm just kind of curious where your heads are at. That stuff. Yeah. Well, I, I personally, I really love the talk about being an upstander instead of a bystander. So when you see bullying happens, you don't just watch it happen. You stop it. Right. And my my idea of the ideal culture and climate and culture in a building. And of course, I mean, this is kind of like pie in the sky thinking, but I want to be able to create a culture where one kid who sees somebody getting bullied knows that they can say, hey, we don't do that here. And they know that two or three friends behind them are going to say, that's right. We don't do that here. You know, and mm -hmm. because, again, I think the community has to stand up against it because they're so savvy um, and it's tough to get people to really understand that there's a very big, at least in the U.S., um, I think all of the U.S. probably and it's and maybe it's just teens in general. There's this big like no snitch kind of thing, right? Yeah. Like, I don't want to be the rat, the punk, the snitch. I don't snitch. I don't tell on anybody. But I try to explain it like in terms, at least with the middle schoolers, 
in terms of adult, I'll tell them and I'll tell their parent in front of them too. I'll say, you know, if your parent or your grandparent or your uncle's at work and they're getting bullied, they would go to their boss and say, I'm getting bullied. I cannot do my work. And we need you to do the same thing. Let an adult know that you're getting bullied or harassed. It's not being a tattletale. Yeah. It's reporting so that because you have a right to be in school without getting bullied and harassed. Um, but it is just so hard to manage and monitor, um, especially if you don't have parents who are on board who can also kind of right. clamp down on them too. Because, um, you know, I'm at a new school this year. I've loved the parents. I think they've been very supportive for the most part. But there are sometimes those parents who, you know, believe whatever their kid says because their kid doesn't lie right, and right, right. it's their kid that's getting bullied when you can see and hear from everybody that it's really not you know it's the other way around but right. parents some parents really struggle understanding and you know believing that their kid might be lying to them yeah. um yeah. so getting parents on board to stop the bullying is so important too and the, and the the consequences of letting bullying go or not addressing it or not taking it seriously are way too great these days you know it's so sad and unfortunate that we do see suicides over the social media pieces yeah, and kids have true. to be really smart too and not you know you, you i've read a lot lately about sextortion you know some some guy who might not even be a kid, but claims to be a kid on social media, coerces a young female to send a nude photo. And all of a sudden they're telling them, you know, you have to pay me thousands of dollars or this goes out on all the media platforms. So kids have to be really smart. You know, even if it is to your boyfriend, they might not be your boyfriend forever and they might be pissed at you later. And what you send over social media is permanent for the most part. Even the Snapchat, you know, people take, like yeah, little screenshots, uh, screenshots of yeah. them and so forth. Right. So nothing safe. And so some of it is about education, right? Really educating kids about it and how life changing and damaging stuff they put out on social media can be. Some of it has been helpful when kids will sometimes bring me a screenshot and say, here is evidence that they've threatened me. You know, they might not have shown me the five, first text messages yeah, where they yeah, were threatening yeah. the other kids so yeah, it, gets, right, right, it right, always right. gets so complicated <laughs> you know it gets really complicated um but that has helped at times too yeah wow that's awesome I, uh, and and the other piece i'll say uh -huh. about social media unfortunately yeah. and my kids have said oh yeah my own kids have said um, you know, sometimes there are fights that are created only for the purpose of other kids videotaping them and right. putting them out on social media instantly. Right. So um, and when I shared that with my kids, I was like, oh, my God, I've heard that. And they're like, oh, yeah, dad, that's the only reason there are fights these days. People want to videotape it and publish it to social media. Um, and, and the other challenge with cell phones, too, is. I have literally been f called by parents to tell me about a fight their kid was just in when nobody even knew about it because it was in a bathroom or, or it never made its way to administration yet because some kid is texting them saying, I just got in a fight or, or I'm really scared, mom, I'm getting threats. So an angry parent comes up and nobody shared with us. They just texted their parent. The, the yeah, phone's wow, just, wow, wow. it really, um, they are a challenge for school administrators. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> That's a really good answer from, from, a especially middle school, person. you know, especially yeah. middle school. I think, I don't know. I don't work in a high school, but I think they're much more mature about it at that age. You know, um, mm -hmm. I think social media can be damaging, like I said, for even for adults. So I'm sure yeah. that piece is still bad, but I think there's at least you're getting into a little bit more maturity uh yeah. middle school you know all the hormones are going bonkers kids are trying to figure themselves out how independent they can be yeah oh man could be a handful yeah, but it's no, awesome too the kids are great i want yeah. to say that yeah you know yeah. especially when they're not in groups and trying to right, show right. off to their friends For love sure. all the kids yeah i know it is easy to kind of get into the muck about all the difficulties and i guess it is important to remember that that's not all, everything and there's yeah and there's the a right side yeah. and there's a zillion other kids who are doing the right thing making good yeah, choices yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and trying to support their friends too yeah right on and okay maybe just one more question i know yeah 
I, I'm starting to sense the my own anxiety about what my wife is thinking downstairs. <laughs> oh, no problem. Time. Maybe we'll have to do a, a two part. I think we do. I think we do. I think we do. I know you're a busy guy, so I, I it's hard because I don't. I, and no, and no I have to. I want to make. I want to say this on air, just for my own sanity too. Is we had scheduled to do this a couple months ago or a month yeah, ago. Don't so. even bring it. Don't. And worry I just about now I got to bring it up because it helps me forgive myself and show appreciation to you for your kindness. Yeah. But I totally just. I could tell you were beating yourself up over it. Really wasn't a problem at all. No, I know it's so kind of you, but we all have busy schedules yeah. and things come up. That's one of my. That's one. That's my baggage, though. Big time. It's like being so fucking high and disorganized my whole life, being late, missing appointments, all that stuff. So it really triggers me. So, yeah, it's also helpful to say it out loud. So just want to yeah. say that. And thank you. You're so and, gracious. And I then. accept so your gracious. apology, even <laughs> though you don't you. need to apologize, <laughs> okay. but I accept it. Got it. I know. Thank you <laughs> for letting me get that out. Uh, I didn't, I almost forgot. Um, the piece around, maybe you can just kind of, share with people kind of what your, maybe some of your routines or habits. I know you kind of talked about them going to therapy, yeah. the support group, so the CBT stuff, any other kind of words of wisdom about just yeah, how you maintain your well being and, and yeah. Try, yeah. So I think, um, I think exercise is huge. Mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, I think I'm more talk than I am action when it comes to working out. I, I have been, you know, I go through waves where I'll be really good for a few months and then not so good. Um, but I recently uh, went to the doctor and had a complete physical and all my markers on the blood work were like red flag, red flag, red flag. <laughs> and my brother who's a family doctor. He convinced me and was like, you know what, if you lose 10, 15, maybe 20 pounds, because I'm a pretty heavy dude. Uh, you know, I bet all those markers would come down. He talked me into a plant based diet. I've only been doing it for a few months, but wow. I am. So I'm trying to eat really well. Uh, I am exercising quite well. I think those are two important pieces. Um, and, you know, I think exercise really, it, it depends, you know, if you're somebody who's like so depressed that you can't get off the couch, set some small goals, walk around the block one time, you know, that gets you off the couch, it gets you outside, you might socialize with a neighbor. And, you know, so start small, but try to get some exercise in there. Um, I love having hobbies. For me, the podcast is a hobby. Um, in the PHP, we had a arts and crafts time. And before I went, I talked to the men in the support group. I'm like, what the hell is arts and crafts? And they're like, oh, the macaroni noodles. But so it, it ended up being awesome for me because at first uh, I went in there and there's all these art supplies. It's amazing if you love art. And I'm not too confident with my art. So I just did some writing and stuff. But eventually I picked up some uh, pastels and made some pictures that I was really surprised I could make. And I ended up bringing that hobby home to my kids. And it's something we'll still do. And I'll grab like mm -hmm. a kid's a picture book and I'll try to draw characters and color them with pastels. And so it's turned into a hobby that I have with my kids and can enjoy. Um, for a while, I was trying to pick up the guitar. It just takes, uh, I don't have the time recently, but I'd love to do that again. So I think having a hobby of some kind, something that feeds you, if it's not your work, um, that that's really important. Um, and I think getting out and socializing is important to make sure that, that you have some time to socialize. You know, I don't have a, a ton of friends, but I make sure that I connect with the friends I have. Um, go out for a beer or a breakfast, you know, whatever it means, or a coffee, um, you know, and, and everybody's kind of tools in their tool belt may look different, but I think those are some big key things. Some people love to journal. I journaled my whole way through the depression, but I'm not a big journaler, but I'm trying more. Um, yeah. So yeah, those awesome. would be some of my pieces of advice. My biggest piece of advice for anybody who's struggling is reach out for help. Don't let the shame stop you. You have nothing to be ashamed about, although I understand how deeply you can feel shame, but reach out for help there. You are not alone. It is so, I am so honest and sincere when I say that there are tons of people who struggle. It is okay to struggle. It's okay to not be okay. Reach out for help um, because that's how you'll, you'll start your path to recovery. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you. That was beautiful. I think, I guess, yeah, we're going to have to do a part two. Sure. Uh, sure. Yeah. All right. Just gab. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's so <laughs> nice to, the, your, your microphone sound is so beautiful too. And so, like, just, yeah, your voice awesome. is coming through so nice and it's just been such a pleasure. And uh, I want to thank you for that. And maybe I'll put it in the show notes and on the web page or whatever, but I know you're, you're pretty consistent with Twitter. I actually tried to put my money where my mouth was. So I've deleted all my social media accounts. So wow, I'm not okay. on, yeah, I'm not on social uh, YouTube. I'm, I am, but yeah, that's um, awesome. And, link, and LinkedIn. Yeah. It's, for me, for me, it was necessary, but uh, I know yeah. you have a pretty big uh, Twitter yeah. Kind of yeah. Twitter's my big social media. Yeah. I'm a little bit on Facebook and some others, but, um, and I, I have tried to really monitor and manage my doom scrolling too. like, I'll go through <laughs> like Facebook doesn't have TikToks, but they have the same kind of thing right, and I'll start right, going right. through it and I'll find it like an hour and a half later. And I'm like, Holy crap, that was stupid. So I've, I'm really getting better at my wife wouldn't say I am, but better at monitoring and managing that and trying to put my time into something that I appreciate more like reading, um, rather than sitting on the phone. Um, so, but I, I, uh, have a lot of respect for you for getting rid of those. Yeah, I had to do what, so can you tell people just so you can say it out loud on here, the, your Twitter handle? Yeah. So the Twitter handle is Al Levin 18. And that's L E V I N. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Al Levin 18. And then the, the podcast, the blog, everything's on the depression files.com. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So that'll, that'll and, be, there'll be links to that for people. Yeah. And um, cool. Thank you. Yeah. I just, again, want to say thank you for all the work you do out there in the world. We need people like yourself doing it and for sharing your wisdom and time with me today. And, uh, it's been a pleasure. Awesome. May the force be with you. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs>